program. All right, so, thank, all right, you. thank you. Okay, thank you, Deputy Director Antonakis. Um, Metria Wilson, where is she? Please give a warm welcome to Metria Wilson, our Director of Legislative Affairs. So we're going to move quickly because we're we're uh, pressed for time. Pressed and for time. Yeah, I think we are, aren't we? <laughs> Somewhat. Just a little bit. All right, I'll slow down. All right. All right. So uh, the, this next segment is about. Uh, uh, can we shut those doors? Changing the rules of the game, uh, and why housing finance reform is 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 the most important wealth inequality issue facing. America today, and we, we wanted to talk about that because as we speak, as you know, there's a tremendous amount of um, initiative going on in this city that really may uh, muck up the works as, as it relates to home ownership. And by the way, did Steve Antonica swear when he was on the stage? I thought I heard him at the very beginning use, didn't he say the S word? No? I thought I heard that. I wanted to say there's no swearing in an NCRC conference, uh. unless I'm doing it, right. All right, so, so what, what's happening is, and I want to just, uh, this is something that most people know. If you look at the blue, that's the 1%, right? That's the amount of wealth uh, controlled, owned by uh, the top 1% of the population. The next 19% uh, is the red space. So what you see for 85% of the population is that green space, that's 15% of the wealth. That's what, eight, that's what most working class, regular, low, moderate, and lower middle income people, this is the amount of wealth that they, they that, <laughs> that that's ain't not right, right that is, is it? That is not right. Right, but here's, uh, here's what I really want to point out to you though in, in understanding this. So for the, that 1%, you, you look over here, or over here, <laughs> but the 1%, less than 10% of the wealth that they have relates to real estate. But look at it, what it is for the rest of the U.S. population, the 85%. 66% of their wealth relates to home ownership. So these folks who begin to talk about, oh, well, <laughs> you know, Home ownership isn't everything. Why don't they invest in the stock market or, or 401ks or you know, in a pension fund? They don't quite get that this is the available option for most people. And frankly, this is the way most people in America have built wealth, built, built equity. I mean, I think what's really important to point out about this statistic is, interestingly enough, that 66.6% .6 when we talk about stocks and investments in pure stock, for the middle three income quartiles in the United States, 3.1% of their wealth actually comes from the stock market. That means for most people, most middle class, working class America, it's actually not the stock market that's generating wealth. And another really interesting thing to note about this is that this big space for this 9.4%, it actually does have a relationship to real estate. See. They don't derive their wealth from being homeowners, but they do derive wealth from being landlords. landlords. Um, and so it's really intriguing to pay attention to the dynamics here. The other component. That's a nice segue into our le next slide. OK, let's go. Called the landlords game. <laughs> has, has anybody in the audience, no. Have you, played the landlords ever, game? Anyone Did ever you play the landlords game? How about just heard of it? There's no reason you should unless you're. You've, you've heard, heard of it? it? OK. You just heard of it? Anybody right. else? Anybody play it? All right. Well, interestingly enough, as I was thinking about how to talk about housing finance reform and this concept of changing the rules of the game, I stumbled upon this really fascinating fact. It's Women's History Month, so I get to brag about another woman. Elizabeth Maggie. Elizabeth Maggie in 1904 came up with this idea of inventing this real estate game to demonstrate concepts about social and economic justice. So her idea, the underlying premise, was that concentrations of property ownership to a tight segment of society actually led to a situation where a lot of people were deprived of wealth and that it wasn't fair. So, oops, all right. Here we go. Under the rules of the landlord game, Maggie proposed doing all sorts of kind of innovative things like, I don't know, free college? 
I could have used that. I could have used that. But, <laughs> or something no, like. No taxes on, on absolute necessities. Right. So, I think the point here is that Maggie had this concept of actually using uh, this game and this property, to, this, this, these rules, to kind of come up with, I don't know, a just economy. But something happened. 1904, times were starting to get a little bit hard. And Maggie did what all responsible patent holders do. She sold her patent. Does anybody want to guess who she sold it to? Does anybody know what the, Milton Bradley. Did I, did I, somebody said Milton Bradley, somebody else? Anybody else? Parker I heard Brothers. Parker Brothers. Parker Brothers. Mm. Ah, very well, good. Well, guess what? That's what it became. The landlord game became Monopoly. And under Monopoly, the rules changed, right? So this game about social and economic justice, about making sure that people had equal opportunities to generate wealth through owning property, was changed to one core objective. And that objective was this, to become the wealthiest player by buying, renting, and trading property. So Maggie's game went from uh, fair, a fair economic system in which you, college was free and that you didn't pay taxes on basic necessities to, once Parker Brothers got it, to a game that, where the richer you got and the more you exploited other people and kicked them off properties and so on, the more you were the winner. Amazing how that works, isn't it? <laughs> we're not one to make comment, but in many, many ways, the rules of the game have been also changed in the economic recovery that's happened in the aftermath of the financial crisis. Because real estate, because owning a home, and because the housing market itself has not recovered at the same pace, what we've seen is that for the 80% of us that are not in the top 20%, we haven't actually felt that much of the recovery because housing prices haven't actually gone back up. In this recovery, what has happened is, I've got this beautiful little pointer here, the value of the stock market has been insane. Right? So the net wealth that's going into the United States and drawing up this average is actually going to that top 20% and more importantly, 1% of the United States. Meanwhile, for those of us who derive our wealth from home ownership, the rates plummeted during so the that, financial crisis. So that's the blue line. And so here's the blue line that's not experiencing the same economic recovery as the, the, the red and the gray which is, you know, more of the other types of wealth accumulation. That's actually experienced a good recovery. As you can see in these years between 2008 and 2013, the blue line representing housing, real estate, has not had the same recovery. It hasn't had the same recovery, but there's something else that's actually even intriguing about that. This gap in thinking about the economic recovery has also been lived out in a gap in housing policy in Washington, D.C., and the way in which lawmakers think about actively going forward with recovery efforts. And one particular way, it really stands out, and that happens to be housing finance reform. When we saw last year the Senate actually introduce a proposal about GSC reform, one thing was clear. While investors were really considered and at the forefront of the legislation, consumers were nowhere to be found. In I mean, fact, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, make no mistake about it. When, when this bill came out, and, I, and most of the NCRC members are well aware of this because you really helped us in the, on this score. But when this bill came out, it had eliminated, the proposal was, and still is, by the way, to eliminate the affordable housing goals. And then there was no commensurate language or mechanism to make up for the affordable housing goals. There was the trust fund and the capital magnets fund, which, by the way, were already law, and it was a matter of getting them funded. But those are, of course, subsidized housing. That's what the trust fund and the capital magnets fund are for. But then there's the affordable housing goals, and it's no joke what they, what they represent. So, where are we? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, looking for the you know segue. what, John? Where we are is where I get to say my yeah. favorite quote. Uh, for years, as, as, a, as a director in policy, I've told my group that, that when it comes to politics, if you're good, you learn to play by the rules of the game. But if you want to be great, 
you have to change the game itself. Right? Because you can't really succeed if the game is made for somebody else and under their rules. What you have to do is change the conversation such that you're at the core and the rules are being decided by you. So in the same way that Parker Brothers changed the rules of the games for Maggie's game on how to have an economic fair way of building wealth, it became changing the rules so that only the rich got richer. So rule number one. What is rule number one, John? It's never underestimate the power of the community chest. There's a community chest. <laughs> <laughs> but what we want to say about that is that all of the people who are in this room right now represent the community chest. And that's because you are financial institutions, you are community groups and advocates, you are housing counselors, you're CDFIs, you're business owners who count on equity in your homes to be able to capitalize your small businesses growth. And if you don't become involved, if you as a community don't speak up about just having the right to generate wealth in this country, nobody else is going to do it for you. We have to collectively decide that we're going to change the game in Washington, D.C. And I think, yeah, please. And most of the folks in this room know this because they've actually been involved in this rule number one, in changing the rules. Because when Coca Warner came out, uh, you'll see that, you know, I mentioned earlier that it eliminated the affordable housing goals. And the next day, NC NCRC, you and we sprung into action to let them know what we thought would be the consequence of this. And frankly, you know, there was a lot of initiative, I don't know if people realize this, here in Washington from consumer groups uh, suggesting that, well, we didn't like the 5% down payment in Corcoran, but otherwise the bill's okay. And, and we had to get to those groups and explain to them what was lost with the affordable housing goals. And, you know, frankly, your voices, a letter that went up to Capitol Hill, the studies that we did to show the difference of what was going to happen began to impact the rule. And another thing actually made an impact. NCRC released a white paper that said, if you care about access, if you care about making sure that credit is affordable and available for the vast majority of consumers in the United States, then you have to require access to be a forefront consideration in the secondary mortgage market. And in our paper, we put forth two proposals. One proposal was one that we felt especially comfortable and excited about, and it went like this. The affordable housing goals have made a tremendous impact in the United States, and before we throw the baby out with the bathwater, we might want to consider the, keeping them exactly where they are. The second proposal did something a little bit different. We said, you know what? We understand that even if we do think that the affordable housing goals made an impact, there are always an opportunity, there should always be an opportunity to take something that's good and make it better. And here's our idea of how you can make an access requirement better. Better for consumers, better for regulators, and better for the industry. And by the way, <clears throat> is it okay to tell them this now? About what's, well, you know what? What's occurring? As we speak? You can tell them what's occurring okay. while it's You know, John, just this one time, I'll let you actually beat me to the punchline. Okay, thank All you. All right, okay. <laughs> so we got a call from the White House yesterday, and they had a bunch of groups on the line. And they gave this, I guess it's somewhat confidential, or was it it's still confidential? I mean, there's enough out in the press. So the Senate Banking Committee released the principles okay, yeah. for the housing finance, but the call itself and the contents so, of the so call So in other words, this is just between us? <laughs> so how the conversation went was the White House said, we're very pleased to report to you that we've made progress on a new bill. When they're going to do away with Coca Warner and they're going to produce a new bill. Yes. Crapo Johnson bill. And yes, you sh you're applauding yourself because NCRC, like the, you know, Mitri doesn't like this analogy, but does any of you remember that one individual standing in front of the tank in <laughs> oh, front of goodness. Tiananmen Square? <laughs> okay, that's what NCRC felt like when all the groups and the administration and Democrats and Republicans were lining up behind Corker Warner and we were saying, wait a second, and you know, they would move, we would move with it. Remember that guy? <laughs> but the difference was this. 
Behind us, in front of us, and around us were you. 250 people alone, 250 organizations alone who signed the letter to Coca Warner saying, this doesn't work for us. So here's the administration now saying, we, we now have a bill, and, and by the way, I preface all these remarks by saying, <laughs> you know, we, the, the devil's in the details, details, right? We haven't seen the bill yet, but this is what we're being told. And they said, look, we, this is the White House, we want to recognize NCRC's leadership in doing and making sure that, the, that we have affordable housing language and we have affordable housing commitment. And honestly, I mean, that's, that, that's the, the point of the rules of the game on this rule is you've got to set the rules, otherwise people are going to set it for you, just like they did with Monopoly versus the landlord's game. So another rule that NCRC has in this housing finance reform debate is that stability, and I know this feels contrary to, to traditional notions about market capitalism, but in the case of housing finance in particular and the secondary market, it's stability that should be preferred over competition. And we have our reasons for saying that. One is, is that when we've seen an increase in competition in the secondary mortgage market, we've actually seen the underwriting standards and therefore the safety of the loans for consumers deteriorate. So what we want is a system that doesn't focus as much on competition as it focuses on allowing government guaranteed institutions to focus on doing clear, responsible underwriting of affordable loan products. And, so and you know, the, the fight now is, of course, that the private sector, I mean, Fannie and Freddie, say what you will about them, one of the things they were for most of their history, until they followed the private market into the subprime abyss, they didn't lead it, until they did that, they were very profitable enterprises. So profitable that a lot of the Wall Street firms and others really salivated at that profit and wondered why they couldn't be the ones receiving that profit. So there's a lot of powers and we're like, again, in front of that tank that's moving and we're positioning ourselves in front of it, trying to make sure that uh, at the end of the day, the consumers that we're most concerned with are served. So, let, yeah, go, go ahead. You know, John, another key point that I want to show to people is that when we see the government serving as the primary source in the secondary mortgage market for financing, whether that be through a government guarantee or just the existence of Fannie and Freddie, we actually see the more stable times um, in the mortgage market. When you have this influx of private label mortgage-backed securities is actually when you see the very problematic period that led to the financial crisis and the debacle with the housing market. And another really important point to note in this beautiful chart that goes back to 1955 is that you see see in our history when we've actually relied on the private institutions to be the primary bearers of risk in the market overall, you have the savings institutions and credit unions. Well, we all remember the SNL crisis. And the reality is bearing that risk was problematic for the private market to do by itself. You have to have a gov government guarantee in housing finance and through a robust secondary mortgage market so that we can have stability and people can actually generate wealth through their home own, their, through owning homes, or not even just generate wealth, keep savings. So I'm, I'm gonna look at this slide for this side of the room so you don't have to strain your eyes. So, just, so you just see, this is where a tremendous amount of wealth, that wealth we talked about for middle income and low and moderate income people, this is the time period when it got built up between 1979, 1975, and really the expansion and, you know, and the, the, the uh, commitment of government agencies, that's FHA, that's Fannie Freddie, that's, that's VA. This is the reason we have the level of home ownership in this country. This is the group up here, this private label security, that everyone, in particular, I think conservatives in government and, and not so conservative people have been arguing that to put it more into the private sector and the, that securitization goes more into the private sector. And again, look at the role that they've played historically. And I, I particularly want to point out this little, see this dip here, which is actually an increase. It's almost, represents almost 30% of market share at that point in time. This here, you all see that? Over here, that piece there. <laughs> So that's the biggest amount of private label securities that where they were in securitizing mortgages. Guess what period that was? It was all that subprime predatory lending. That's the role they played. So be wary of pushing things into that private sector and private label securitization. Or certainly preferring it over uh, the stability of the market as a whole. 
The third rule in NCRC's Blue Book for Housing Finance Reform is a simple one. Access to conventional credit is key. We know this again from the financial crisis, particularly in communities of color, for example. One of the big problems is that you had a lot of prime credit consumers who ended up with subprime loans. The difference is about 200 basis points, which on its face in this room, you guys appreciate the significance, but I'll say that that leads to, under some estimates, about $100,000 in equity that was lost. So, making sure that you have access to conventional credit in traditionally underserved communities means that you have to make sure that you have an access mechanism, a mandate. And that leads us to talking about John's favorite subject of conversation. And my favorite slide. And as Greg, Greg Squires can, where's Greg? He always criticizes me for not understanding. Is not here? Where is he? There you are, Greg. Greg, I actually get this slide. <laughs> All right. So, and I want you to get it. So here's the role, here's the affordable housing goals, uh, the affordable housing goals of Fannie and Freddie, and who's benefited from them, and what the amounts are. Okay, and on the left side of the column is the, the millions of families that, that were recipients of loans that were securitized by Fannie and Freddie over the years, and it adds up to 63 million people since 2002. And the uh, red bar is basically the total of all uh, affordable housing securitizations. And by the way, it's not just single families. In 2012, for example, Fannie and Freddie securitized 600,000 units of affordable rental housing. They're the biggest purchaser of low-income housing tax credits. Credits. They're second to none in, in, in the creation via securitization of affordable rental housing. So, but this is what I really want to point out to you, so you can get an inkling of what's at stake here. Because this is the system, these are the rules of the games that are being changed as we watch and we're trying to make sure we stay in front of that tank. So, this area here, 2010, 11, 12, that's when N. DeMarco came into play to say to Fannie and Freddie, relative to the affordable housing goals. Before this, the, the different FHA people would say, okay, the affordable housing goal, they'd establish it, the director would establish it. And so, for example, in 2008, the goal for Fannie and Freddie was you had to securitize 51% of the things you securitize. 51% of everything that Fannie and Freddie had to securitize had to be fall under the affordable housing goals, either affordable rental or to a low in, lower modern income or to a minority household in a, in a, in a geographic area. 51%. DeMarco comes in and says, forget the goals. Do what the industry brings you. Whatever the industry brings you that fall under the goals, okay, securitize those. But don't mock it. Don't go out there. Don't tell the banks. And, and we had many bankers come and tell us. They don't get the calls anymore from Fannie and Freddie looking for affordable housing stuff, where they then go out and try to get their correspondent lender, lenders or their branches or their mortgage companies to, to do outreach and do things to, to generate more mortgage product. So, you know, uh, anyone here from HUD? Okay, because he, he's talking tomorrow morning. Okay, so the Secretary of HUD is saying, well, I was in housing in New York City, and these goals didn't have any impact. These goals didn't have any impact. Just in 2010 alone, that's six million households that benefited from the affordable housing goals. And now, I think, I think, I think we're, we're coming together in some ways with this new bill that's been proposed. We, we're encouraged. Uh, again, the, the, the devil's in the details, right. but make no mistake of what will be lost here if we muck up this system in a way. We don't have to call them affordable housing goals. We don't have to call them Fannie and Freddie. Whatever you come up with, but just make sure that the, the window is open for working class people to be able to procure mortgages at prime rates, responsible rate, terms and conditions. And that's what this is all about. Yeah. And John, I think there are a couple of things that we should also point out about this slide. I think one thing we have to do is we have to acknowledge that a lot of people have raised concerns about the fact that Fannie and Freddie, under, this, under the affordable housing goals, had quite often been given the opportunity to count a particular household multiple times. And so one of the things that we did, aside from just giving you this number of the 63 million households, which is the number that Fannie and Freddie actually submitted to the administration, who verified it and then submitted it to Congress, 
But NCRC conducted its own analysis, and what we did is we actually controlled, which meant that we only counted one goal, the largest goal, the income-specific goal, each year so that we could account for the fact that they weren't double counting. And what we found is that under that analysis over the past 10 years, you saw about 2.5 million to 3 million, and in some years, 4 million households actually benefit from the affordable housing goals. That's really important because when people tell you that the goals were gamed, you can tell them, okay, but even if the goals were gamed, you're still talking about 4 million, 2.5 million, 3 million families each year at the lowest, and we know that number is artificially low, that still benefited by having a requirement in the, the, the conventional market to serve them. That number, that 2.5 million, 3 million, 4 million, has never even, no one has suggested that it is capable of being replicated or replaced by any of the other proposals that are out there. Right, so that brings us to rule number four. Because whatever happens in this new world of mortgage finance, we have to have a system of affordable housing goals that are measurable. We need to be able to see that, in fact, that's happening, that, that low and moderate income people, communities of color, uh, disabled people, Indian tribes, traditionally underserved populations have an opportunity to get mortgage financing at responsible rates, competitively priced rates. We need to be able in this new, whatever this new build is going to look like, and this is, as you go up to the hill tomorrow, it's going to be an important issue. Because we don't want to be lulled into, NCRC, you're great. You know, uh, the White House, you know, you guys are great. You really helped us move, advance this discussion, and, you know, we, we, we're, we're moving forward. That's all nice, and it's all nice to hear. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure that there's a system where that's measurable, that, that where we can see, where we can look at what the lenders are doing at, at, you know, from year to year and be able to assess and what the, what the new GSE folks are doing to assess whether or not they're serving the populations we most care and about. And John, you just made a key point. Having measurable goals is all about transparency and accountability. The very things that contributed to the financial crisis in the past was the opaque nature of housing finance. We need to have a system that provides clear-cut metrics so that we can judge entities based on their performance against those metrics. And, so, and they asked us, actually, they said, um, so if, if not the affordable housing goals, is there another way we could have the industry uh, be responsive to, uh, to the needs of, 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 of traditionally underserved people, of low and moderate income people, of people of color. Is there another system? And so NCRC and its bright staff, all biases aside, uh, came up with uh, a model, which, uh, which so, go ahead. Yeah, so our model actually was released in a, in a white paper uh, that you, you already you pressed that button. For me. You know what? This tag team thing, sometimes it's tough. He goes forward, I go backward. That's <laughs> but uh, I'll go yeah, back so to that what works you picked. Too. So there we go. The incentive model is really about having a metric for measuring how entities would perform in the secondary mortgage market. So there's still a target, right? There's still a goal. But that goal is actually not tied to... That goal is tied to performance and an entity's ability to serve unmet housing needs. Where it becomes interesting is that that goal actually also establishes the cost of the affordable housing assessment. So what NCRC is saying is that if you want to utilize the government guarantee, the full faith and credit of the United States government, which at the end of the day is really backed up by us taxpayers, you can do that but you have to make an other guarantee to us. And that is that you will commit yourself to serving the entire market. Every single worthy taxpayer who's got the credit should be entitled to go to your entity and receive mortgages. That doesn't seem like a big ask, but for a lot of people, it was. So under our system, you can do that, and you can serve the market, and you can meet the target, and if you do so, that's wonderful. If you do more in meeting the target and addressing unmet housing needs, then we think that we should reward you and provide you incentives to do that. 
So the cost of the affordable housing assessment that was already built into the Corker Warner proposal actually slides down based on you meeting these unmet housing needs. But you might be a secondary market entity that says, you know what, I've done the math and the business decision and I don't really want to serve those markets or I, I don't want to do that. Not this year, I can't meet that target. Well, for you, if you're not serving the full scope of credit worthy borrowers in the United States, then it's not fair for you to be able to access the government guarantee at the same cost. You should applaud for that because I think it's a reasonable proposition. So what we want you to do is your affordable housing assessment should be higher. And then that money that you pay can be put towards affordable housing activities like the Housing Trust Fund, like the Capital Magnet Fund, um, like any other incentives that are created or special programs that are created to serve affordable housing through this newly created entity. The notion here is, is that if you're not going to do the job, then give us the money that you would have generated so we can do the job for you. And if you continue not to do the job, then you don't need to access the government guarantee. All right. So, you all understand this slide? So, the, oh, it's, <laughs> I beat you this time. I'm that's sorry. all right. Uh, so, on this side, this uh, this is the affordable housing goals. If this red line. So, on this side, if you're doing a good job, like 50% of the loans you're doing, uh, in fact, go to traditionally underserved populations or what gets defined as affordable housing populations. If you're you're in that space, you pay less for this government guarantee. If you're down here and you're not doing as much, you pay more for that guarantee. Right. And here's the interesting thing. This looks like what the administration and, and Johnson Crapo have adopted. That is correct. Uh, We'd still rather have the affordable housing goals with the very specific <laughs> numbers and all that, but if that, at the end of the day, we can't have that. Having a system that's a carrot and a stick, it rewards those who are doing well by charging them less for the guarantee, and it, it penalizes those, or uses the stick, for those who do not serve these populations. But you know what, John? That rule. brings us to rule number five. Rule number five. five. Yep. Yeah, it's gonna take a strong regulator with the right tools to actually make this work. One of the critical fights in housing finance reform is to give whatever regulator takes shape the ability to enforce standards and norms and to develop an evaluation system that is capable of fairly assessing performance. And I have a colleague at the National Community Reinvestment Coalition who has dedicated his career in very important ways to examining evaluation systems and making sure that we have fair systems of doing that. Does anybody know who I'm talking about in this room? Where's How did Josh? you guess it was Josh, Josh Silver? Here? So Where it's is part, he? he's Josh. right there. Josh, we, we think you should be the new head of the independent regulatory <laughs> agency. <laughs> So as part of NCRC's proposal, our Josh Silver made sure that what we were proposing included a very, very strong evaluation um, and reporting requirements. He also even suggested using evaluation and reporting requirements on a local base level. So that's another way in which NCRC is trying to build upon and improve the access requirement in the secondary mortgage market, um, as opposed to just being uh, comfortable with the status quo. This is the last slide yeah, right there. So, so here's the point, and this is where I stole the punchline, is when you're changing the rules of the game, you have to take that chance. You have to stand in front of that tank once in a while. You have to be willing to with, withstand the, the fact that people are not happy that you're not, and not going along with this, the, the game plan that other people have. So behind this Corker Warner initiative was the administration, and here we had ourselves in fighting the Obama administration, fighting the Republicans, fighting the Democrats. But when you take a chance, because you believe in something, that you stand for something, good things can happen, especially if justice is on your side. And it is fair in this society and world that as we have a system of capitalism that it needs to be democratic. It needs to be such that Thank you. It needs to be such that, that if you're willing to work hard, play by the rules, pay your taxes, that you have the ability to be treated by institutions and by people in a way that allows you to build wealth and prosper and have your household, your children, 
your ancestry, your, your, your future ancestry, I guess that's, that doesn't even make sense, but you know what I'm saying, <laughs> that, they, that there's an opportunity for them to be able to prosper in this system. And that's what we do every day. NCRC takes a chance. Where's the chance? Right there. Here's the chance. <laughs> um, and as it turns out, this chance was a good one. You know, sometimes you pick up those things in the Monopoly game, they're not so good. This was a good one. Hey, John? Yes. So I have the bad chance. All right. Here's the point. This is not over. The Ain't game the isn't truth. over. So when we started out, we were talking about it. And in housing finance reform, affordable housing wasn't even a consideration. Because of you, we were actually able to change the conversation and make affordable housing a key issue going forward in housing finance reform. And because of you and your efforts, we were able to do something that at the start of this, nobody thought we would be able to do. And that's to get an access requirement into the Senate banking chairman and ranking members bipartisan bill. Yeah. But that doesn't mean anything if that bill doesn't contain the language that we need to have it contain. Yeah, I was, that was That's going right. somewhere with that, but then well, I lost it. It, it doesn't I, mean anything if the language doesn't actually do what we need it to do. It doesn't have enough accountability. It doesn't have enough transparency. It doesn't give enough strength to the regulator or the numeric targets. So tomorrow is my favorite day in NCRC's conference because as the Director of Legislative and Policy Advocacy, it's Hill Day, right? Yeah. And that's the day I get to get you guys up on the Hill. I want you to take that opportunity to talk about housing finance reform. I want you to take that opportunity to say, if you care about wealth, for 80% of the residents in your state, you care about this issue and you care about access. I want you to go upstairs, I want you to go on the hill and say, you know what? We need access and affordability. That means we need a government guarantee. That means that we need a mandate like the affordable housing goals or NCRC's incentive model, and we need that now. Yeah, and look, Secretary Donovan is going to be here in the morning, and he may get up at breakfast, and please all be here, um, and, and he may get up and say wonderful things about NCRC. <laughs> Maybe not. We'll see. Um, he may say wonderful things about mortgage finance reform, GSE reform, and how things are going great, and thanks to NCRC, blah, blah, blah. But when you're on the Hill, and let me tell you, the folks in Massachusetts who talked to Elizabeth Warren, the folks in, in Ohio who talked to Senator Brown, the folks who in Oregon who talked to Senator Ber Merkley, and the folks in New Jersey who talked to Senator Menendez, that made a difference. Because those are our stalwarts on this issue in the Senate Banking Committee. And they are not going to accept a bill that, that moves us off the path of home ownership for working class people and people working their way up the economic ladder. So what we have to do is somehow be gracious about the fact that we're making progress, but make no mistake about it, we haven't seen the language yet. And as Mitria says, you know, we don't want to see a bill that comes out and that says a regulator may, or the uh, insuring, insurance guarantee may. We want the shall word, or the must words, because that's what we're losing. These, re these, re these goals are mandated by law. The, the amount is not mandated, but the fact that there will be goals and that the Fannie and Freddie need to do it is not a shall or a may. I mean, not a may, it's a shall. So we need to be somewhat sophisticated in our approach to this and encourage them moving forward, but make sure that they understand that they will have a fight on their hands, a national fight, if we don't ensure that the rules of the games end, end up being that working class people Low and moderate income people still have access to decent, affordable rental housing as well as to home ownership. Yep. You did a good job. You too. Mitria.